are and what I want to do is go through this message today and unpack in expository or exposition fashion, expository fashion, unpack, you know, what James is saying. And what we're really going to be talking about today is, um, it, here's the purpose of the message, if I stated it in one sentence, we are brought forth to live a life of pure religion. Now, a lot of times the people use the word religion today to mean a bunch of things. But, you know, I'm keying in on James's use of the terminology. For example, the very last phrase we read from verse 26, that, that, that this man's religion is worthless. Based on the condition of verse 26, that if anyone thinks himself to be religious, yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Wow, does that raise some huge questions for us. So there is such a thing as pure and undefiled religion. Verse 27, the very next verse. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. There is religion that is right. There is religion that is real. I mean, how many of us, part of my personal testimony was that I thought a bunch of different people had religious opinions, and every human opinion was of equal value, and my opinion was I didn't need it. So, but that was just judging religion on the basis of human definitions of religion. There's all kinds of concepts of religion, but... Here what James is getting at is there is a pure and undefiled and true religion. And it is in Christ. And there are other practices where people who think they're religious, but their religion can actually amount to worthless. Strong words there in verse 26. So this is where we're headed to. And uh, the purpose is we, we are brought forth. I'm using that terminology as well from James 1.18. He brought us forth. We are brought forth for a life of pure religion, not worthless religion. Now, I, I have just a feeling, a spiritual conviction, a mental thought, and as we are all uh, trying to live in this new context of a lot of things that are going you know, strange in our culture that we, uh, many of us have not experienced before, if any of us have ever experienced with this coronavirus and our society changing, you know, but, you know, my thought is, this is the perfect time for God's people to be his people. It, it's not the time for us to, to, to shrink back and do nothing. It's the time for us to live forth who we are in Christ and serve our community, and serve each other, and continue to worship Christ, continue to disciple, continue to engage in mission. And the only question we have to answer is, how do we do that in our new context? And that's why these teachings in James are still so inherently relevant today. Because they're going to show us what pure and true religion is like. And there's stuff out there where people even think they're still being quote-unquote religious, but it's defiled. It's really important that we understand what God has called us to. So let's get into the text. We're going to have two main points today on uh, uh, fruit, the, the idea of good fruit and bad fruit. And I need to be clear on how I'm using that terminology. And we're going to get into this text, and we're going to unpack this. The reason why I'm using the terminology fruit is this. Look again at James 1.18. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth, by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. Wow. So here's how I'm using the word fruit today. Number one, the way James used it was this. God brings forth true followers and believers of Jesus Christ as the first fruits. Last week when we ended with that verse, we talked about how that use of the idea of first fruits is an Old Testament worship concept that the, the firstborn or the first fruits of the field were used to give, God, give to God in worship. So God is bringing forth his people as his own worship offering. We are the first fruits. And, and that begs the idea, first suggests there's, maybe there's more coming, and that's true. 
Because James also in his book is going to talk about how, how uh, the end times and, and final judgment is coming. And how should we live? And so the idea is, you know, we're, true Christians are the beginning of the worshipful shining forth of God's salvation, which is going to keep going until the very end. It's a powerful, beautiful picture. I'm also today using the same concept of fruits a little differently. And here's how. Let me show you why and how. Because if, if you just glance over the verses we read, starting in verse 18, it's kind of the key concept, and going through verse 26 and then 27, I have to include verse 27, um, what you see is James, again, does a wonderful thing to teach us. Paul does this. James does this. Here's what it looks like. Here's what it does not look like. So if we are the first fruits and we have God in us, we will look like this. We will not look like that. Positive, negative description. So God's first fruits people will bear forth the fruit of his life in your life. You see what I'm saying? So just I'm acknowledging right up front that I'm, I understand I'm using the word fruit as James used it to be the people themselves, but then also to describe, because here's what he's going to do. He's going to go right in verse 19, and, and here it is. Good fruit is pure and undefiled religion. That's point number one. The good fruit of God's true people is described in multiple ways. Okay? Now, in verse 18, he brought us forth. So the question in your outline there is, what is the instrumentality of the change? See, verse 18. God does something in your life when he brings you to Christ. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creation. God brings a change to your life when he brings you to Christ. He's the one doing it. So what we're going to describe here and talk about, this is what allows James to differentiate between what's true and what's false. This is what allows James later on to get to that huge conclusion in verse 26. If someone considers himself to be religious, but he can't bridle his tongue, I'm just paraphrasing quickly, he de he's self-deceptive, he deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Wait a second, can you judge anybody and determine if their religion is worthless? It, well, the Bible does, and it makes it very clear. So here's the point that we, we need to drive to. This isn't about human opinion. This isn't about what my preference of a religion versus another person's opinion or preference of their religion. This is about God bringing forth by the word of his truth a first fruits for his worship and glory. And when God comes into your life, he will produce this change. It's going to happen. And this is what it's going to look like. It's going to look like pure and undefiled religion. So, uh, how are we to receive it? How are we to receive what God is doing when he brings us forth by the word of truth? I'm going to draw your attention to verse 21, where James is going to say, in humility, receive the word implanted. Okay? So here, here you go. What am I doing? I'm unpacking from the text, who's the main actor? God. What's he doing? Bringing us forth. How does he do it? What's our part in it? We need to receive from God his word implanted in us. Wow. Then we're going to list the good fruit. So let your eyes look at this block of text. And what James does is he, he mixes it together. He bounces back and forth a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw your attention first to the positive. And then in point two, we're going to get to the negative. So if I mention verse numbers, just follow along with the verse numbers. So here we go. James 1.18, he brings us forth. 19. This you know, my beloved brethren. Three quick things that show what us being first fruits, bearing good fruit, looks like. One, be quick to hear. Two, be slow to speak. Three, be slow to anger. Why? 
Because in verse 24, explicit, explanatory reason why, why should we be slow to anger? Because the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. As James is teaching here in the book, and as, as it happens throughout the balance of the whole book, this isn't just about single incidents of anger. We all have anger. <laughs> we all have to control our anger. We all have certain circumstances where we cross the line, maybe. But this, this is about the lifestyle of the fruit of a person who is God's first fruit. A person who God has come into, who God has brought forth to glorify himself is the kind of person who does not live his life in the community through anger in ongoing fashion. It's the kind of person who, who wants to see God's righteousness prevail rather than his own or his own will, his own desires. So, okay, that was, that was the reason for the third thing. I'm going to keep listing, though, because it says I, I have in the outline, list the good fruit. So this is the good fruit that comes out of the first fruits. If God has changed you and come into your life, okay? Uh, t- verse 21, in the negative, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. So a person who is, is being brought forth by God has an internal desire, has an understanding in their mind and their heart and their soul and their strength that, that we need to put aside the sin, the filthiness, and all that remains of wickedness. That's the negative. Then the fifth thing, I'm counting number five, the next phrase in verse 21, in humility receive the word implanted. That's the positive. So like the Apostle Paul does in um, a couple of his letters, it's in Colossians, I think it's also in Ephesians, um, Paul talks about put off and put on. Paul uses that terminology. This is the same biblical concept, and it's from James. He doesn't say put off and put on like the same way Paul does, but it is the same concept. You see what, what James said in 21, putting aside all filthiness and that, all that remains of wickedness, in humility, receive the word. So here's, this is what, this is the fruit of the Christian life. This should be normal. If, if you and I are true born again Christians who truly follow Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, this is the way we live. Putting off, repenting from, striving to put away those sinful things which do not glorify God, and humbly receiving the word implanted. I'm going to pause here for a second, because that's number five, and I have seven things I've listed here about these, these elements. I call them good fruit of, that come from the first fruits. Okay, And I'm going to pause here and say this. This is, this is where, in your own personal application, or this is where, in a church's life, in your own personal discipleship, this is where things can get off kilter if we don't do both. What I mean is, like Paul and like James, we should both repent from sin and have greater faith in whatever God's teaching and whatever God wants us to do. Okay? So, what I mean by saying we can get off um, or, or imbalanced or off the rails is this. Have you ever heard of some preaching or teaching ministries where their main focus is the repent, 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 and they beat people up with the law, and they beat people up with the wrong thing, and they, you know, you got to stop this, you got to stop that, you can't do this, you can't do that. Um, one of our youth many years ago in South Dakota, he was, you know, we were all having a good joking time like we sometimes do, you know, we were f- having fun, joking around, and he tried to imitate a preacher, and the, this, this, this uh, junior high school student, this was his imitation of a preacher. Repent! It's your fault. And that was it. And, and we all laughed because it was funny because this is 14-year-old young man who is actually the son of one of our deacons. <laughs> and he, it's your fault. Where's the grace, though? Right? Where's the grace? And well, Okay, that's one side. See, we can get off-balanced in that. Now, is that true, though? James says putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. Yes, that's true. But James also says, in humility receive the word. So what else must we do? 
How do you come to God's word? Do you come to God's word with an attitude of criticism or opinionization or I'm going to judge God's word on the basis of some political movement that's happening or some other weird religious stuff that's happening? Um, or do you come to God's word with full humility? You know, to this one I will look, to him who trembles at my word. Do you come to God's word with an open heart saying, Lord, teach me. I don't have the wisdom. You have the wisdom. Lord, give me wisdom. Open my eyes. Open my ears. I am a willing and open student. Whatever you say in your truth, I will receive. Lord, mold me. You're the potter. I'm the clay. Make me what you... How do you come to the word? Now, but see, some people can get overbalanced that way. They can become so nicey-nicey with the good parts, and there are good parts. There's sweet parts to Scripture, incredibly sweet parts. We are saved by grace alone. Oh, the grace of God we need, he gives. The very judgment that he demands, he supplies. Yes, we have all that we need in Christ. But then sometimes people get a little too fluffy-duffy on the nice side that they don't preach against the sin. See, what did James do here? See, here's what I'm saying. We have to have both in their proper balance and their proper place. For the Christian life to be full, to be free from sin, but also growing in God's truth, we have to recognize both in proper place and proper balance. And this is what James is doing. So we can't overemphasize one to the exclusion of the other. We have to actually recognize both. James is calling God's people in verse 21, therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, comma, in English there's a comma, I'm going to pause there with the comma, and I'm going to say this. Brothers and sisters, we are, many of us, shut down in our own homes, and maybe we're you know, trying to figure out what to do in this new situation, and I'm going to, but I still have to say this. If you're still stuck in some sin, stop. Repent. Get rid of the filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. We can't, as Christians, justify continued habitual sin repent. But I, I'm not going to stop there. I paused because of the English comma. I paused, and now I'm going to go to this. In humility, receive the word, and what's the rest of the phrase in verse 21? Which is able to save your souls. Now, here's the thing. This is, I alluded to this earlier. James is saying, okay, he's, he is an apostle, a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's, he says in, in chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 2, he says, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. So James is writing as a believer in Jesus to other believers in Jesus who he knows that, that God is bringing them forth as the first fruit. And he's saying to them, though, but continue to receive the word implanted in you so that it purifies you, so you live a real religion, not fake, and it's able to save your souls is, is a hearkening to the final day. That the word of God is able to carry you your whole life long, even to final judgment and then into eternal glory. So there's a hint there of that future aspect. So this is so important that we do both and we do them both to the glory of God. If there's a sin in your life that you're sick and tired of, good, then repent. And if you're not sick and tired of your sin, you got another problem. I have to move, I have to move on in verse 25, uh, 22. Okay, I'm going from 21 to 22. But prove yourselves to be doers of the word. This is going to be element number six. Six, or six and seven. Now, watch how I do this. Prove yourselves to be doers. I'm going to stop with that phrase in verse 21. Let your eyes fall down to verse 25 because I'm staying with the positive statements. In verse 25... The one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. See the word doers in verse 22 and doer in verse 25. This man is blessed in what he does. And then let your eyes go down to verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So I, you, if I included the doers from verse 22 and doer from verse uh, 25, that's another uh, element, okay? I, that's like number um, six. 
be a doer of the word. And then number seven, the seventh fruit, list the fruit. This is what a Christian life looks like, um, is be a, um, I see, abide by the liberty, the law of liberty which is in Christ. These are all descriptions James uses to talk about pure and undefiled, real religion of the God who brings us forth by his word of truth to be his first fruit. First of all, it is the people themselves who are saved in Christ who are God's first fruit to his worship and glory. And how should they live? They live bearing this fruit. You see how I'm using the terminology that way. Now here's something, this, this is the key that, that unlocks the text. <laughs> I don't use that phrase a lot, but I'm, I'm gonna use it the, today. Do you remember last week when we talked about, um, in verses 12 through 18, uh, James uses that idea, he's talking about temptation, he's talking about sin, in verse 13, am I being tempted by God? No, God does not tempt, he's not tempted by evil, and he, he himself does not tempt anyone, okay? But in verse 14 it says, each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Verse 15 then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Okay? There's a beautiful play on words that James is using here. Are you ready? From that, first, that, that earlier section we did last week, James uses the illustration of the adulterous you know, sin mother, the, the mother, the, the lust that brings forth the sin, gives birth. When he uses the birth language, he's picturing it like an adulterous thing. And that child who is, is, I'm using metaphor, as James was, okay, that child's sin grows up and becomes death. Did you see the comp- comparable positive um, in verse 18? In exercise of his will, he brought us forth. He brought us forth. To counteract the devastating effect of pregnant lusts, birthing of sin, which leads to death, God exercised his will in giving us one of his good gifts. He chose to give us birth. Okay? This unlocks the text. What I'm saying is, James is saying there's two different kinds of people in the world. There are those who are still in their sin, and that's going to lead to death, and that sin is born of lust. See, he's using birthing language. But then there are those who are brought forth by God. Wow. See, the Apostle John is going to use born language in John 1, 12, and 13. As many as received Jesus, the those who believed on his name, he gave them the right to be called children of God, who were born, and I'm just paraphrasing quickly here, you know, born not of, not of man, not of the will of the flesh, okay, but they were born of God, James 1, 12 and 13. And you get into John chapter 3, and Jesus says you must be born again, you must be born from above, you must be born from the Spirit. Everyone who believes in Jesus Christ is born again. So, It's not meant to be awkward language, but what what we are meant to see here is there's a radical difference between those who are are letting the sin, which is like a child born of the lost, lead to death, and those who are brought forth by God, the creator, the omnipotent, the personal, the savior, the God who loves his people is bringing them forth, birthing them to live a whole completely different life than the way of sin in the world. Wow, and it's powerful. So if you and I are are living in a pure and true religion, we have to understand God has given us this new life for a reason. Pure and undefiled religion is the good fruit that comes from the first fruit, the people. And so that's why he's going to end in verse 27 uh, with this pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. You see, we're not living in that pattern of sin being birthed out of lust that leads to death. That shouldn't describe us 
anymore because that's not who we are. We are living now in this pure and undefiled religion where our concern now, being repentant believers, is our concern is to minister to others, orphans and widows. The, these, these represent in the first century the hopeless and the helpless of the world, and it was the church's job to minister to the least of the least and to keep oneself unstained by the world. See, that, that's all part of that... that um, putting aside of all filthiness and, re- and all that remains of wickedness. Keep oneself unstained by the world. So, morality, pure, true, faith-based repentance from sin, living a holy life, living in purity um, in all of our life and behavior. And I want to say a word, and I know there might be kids in the room, I'll just say it one time living in pure holiness the way God teaches us to sexually, living in pure holiness and obedience to to the Lord's teaching, humbly receiving his teaching to teach us how to live, and that this is what God wants from his people. This is the real religion. And I I have to say this, you know, that this this is not possible to be achieved. It's not possible to be done apart from God bringing us forth. God acts on us first. By the word of his power, he brings us forth. So if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if there's a time that you can say that that you turn directly to Jesus in prayer and asked him to forgive you, believing that he died on the cross for your sin and rising again from the dead, if you had a born-again experience with Jesus Christ, he changed your life. He brought you forth to live this new way. That is the true, pure right religion and then we live it out to to serve and bless and minister to others Um, that perfect law picture there's another play on words that he has here he talks about the the person who looks in the mirror and walks away and forgets Um, that's the wrong view Uh, and then there's the person who looks at something else and it's not looking at the mirror it's looking at the perfect law Well, what's the perfect law? We're talking not about Old Testament law per se. We're talking about the fulfillment of all God's perfection in Jesus Christ. And the only way we can live the law to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, as it says in Leviticus 19.18, is if Christ has forgiven us of all of our sin, we know we are his, he is ours, we've died to ourselves, and we now live to serve and minister to others. This is the kind of righteousness that God wants to bring about. This is the pure and undefiled religion. So what's the bad fruit? We're going to wrap this one up pretty quickly. And we're going to go back to James now. So we, we've, we've looked at how, how are we brought forth to live a life of pure religion. And I unpack that from verse 18. God brings us forth. We receive it in humility. And then we looked at some of those elements of what it means to be a true Christian. Well, James is very concerned. See, what he's done now in the book thus far, we've kind of made it through the introductory section, and now everyone might hopefully should realize that we've we've embarked upon James's terminology of the doing. And this is the thing the book is probably most um, uh, known for, you know? Uh, Don't be a hearer, but a doer of God's word. And this is where James begins to talk about that, and he's going to talk about that for the rest of the book. But James is very concerned... And, and I'm going to show you why, because our conclusion is going to go to Matthew 7 and what Jesus taught. James is very concerned that there is in the world true religion which is of God and glorifies God. And there's also in the world false religion which is not from God. And he's very concerned, this is again one of the earliest books in the New Testament brought by the brother of Jesus, It's very practical to real everyday life, and he's very concerned that this is really all about discipleship, that you and I would follow Christ for real, okay? And if there's young kids in the room at home, you know, this is is your purpose statement for today, that you and I would follow Jesus for real, not for fake, okay? (laughs) That's the point. So now this is what the opposite looks like. We're going to drop into James 1.22. We left off with the first half, so I'm going to call this halfway through 1.22. 1.22b. Sometimes people use A and B. 
okay? See, because in 122, he said, but prove yourselves doers of the word. That was the positive. But now let's pick up with the second part of, of verse 22. And not merely hearers who what? Delude themselves. So the, the biblical definition of, of James's concept here of self-delusion is a person who hears the scripture, who hears about God in the Bible, more importantly, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he is, he's uncreated, he is the creator, who is with the Father and the Holy Spirit eternally, and he came into this world in the flesh, we're about in a couple of weeks to celebrate Easter, he came to this world into the flesh, and he died on the cross for our sins, for no sin of his own, because he lived a perfect life, but we sinned, and he died on the cross as our substitute for us, for our sin, and he rose again from the dead in the power and glory of God, and he is God's Messiah, the Savior, God in the flesh. You see, you hear that, and that message has been heard by a lot of people, but do you do it? What do you mean, do I do it? Have you ever actually believed in Jesus? It's not good enough to go, yeah, okay, that's fine. Now, I know I just did a big no-no when it comes to live streaming. I walked off screen. But is that what you're doing to God? Sure, I hear you, God. Thanks for letting me know. And you walk away. No, that's self-delusion. That's the definition of being deceived. This is the very word of God. Your maker has spoken to you. Don't just hear it and stop. Hear it and do something. Respond. Respond by believing. And then also following whatever he teaches. I'm going to go on here. Let's pick up in verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. And this is why I said that, that the key that unlocks this text is actually some of this birthing language, right? What he said in, in, in the earlier section from preaching from last week is he talked about this adulterous uh, love affair with lust that births the child's sin which leads to death in a picture of a metaphor of adultery. Well, what's interesting here is, is the word face in verses 23 and 24 is more literally the face of his birth. Literal translation. The face with which he was born. What James has in mind is what a person really looks like. They look in a mirror, sees his own face as it really is, then he deceives himself because the truth does not stay with him to change his perspective. You, you and I look in the mirror every morning, whether you brush your teeth, you shave, you comb your hair, put on makeup if, if you're a lady. We, we look in the mirror and then we walk away and all of a sudden we don't even know what we look like anymore. This is the person who hears the word of God but then walks away and doesn't do it. It's like looking in a mirror and going, yep, Yep, I get it, uh-huh. And then you walk away and you go, and you just keep sinning. You walk away and you, and you don't obey what was taught. You walk away and you don't do, you know, that balance of two things I talked about in the first point. You know, get rid of the filthiness, but humbly receive the word. You walk away, you don't do either one. That's self-delusion. Because the person, the self has become more important, or already is more important, than God and his word. Wow. Let's keep reading. Um, verse 26. Let your eyes drop down to verse 26. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, and this is why this is a kind of a hard message to preach and teach. It's kind of a hard message for all of us to understand because I'm not talking about people who aren't Christians versus people who are Christians. I'm talking about people who claim to follow the true God. They claim, see, this, James is, is really warning about what true and real religion is like versus false or worthless religion. If anyone thinks to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart. See, there's another form of self-deception. 
delude themselves in the end of verse 22 and deceives his own heart in the middle of verse 26. This man's religion is worthless. So this is the negative side of the coin of what I already preached in the first point, which is if God has birthed you, if God has brought you forth by the word of his power, you are the first fruits of God and you will bear good fruit because you're the first fruit. You're going to live a completely different way because you know God and he knows you and he made you that way on purpose to serve him, to love him, to turn from the sin which so offends him and frankly also ruins our lives and also to live for him in his glory and to serve others. Pure and undefiled religion. This is the opposite. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I go to church. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. And then they turn around and they use the same tongue. James is gonna do this later as we get in further into the book. They use the same tongue to criticize, to judge, to hurt, to tear down another brother or sister in Jesus Christ. If a man's religion in his heart does not help him to tame his tongue, then his religion is worthless. Wow. So, let's do this. Um, this is the way I might term the application. I might say this. If you call yourself a Christian, ask yourself, which one of these descriptions am I most like? The first one, pure and undefiled religion, or the second one, um, which, which we just went through, point two, the bad fruit or the worthless religion? Which one, and, and I'm not... Here's, here's the amazing thing. You know, the Bible does teach. Jesus teaches in Matthew 7, 1. James is, is gonna teach you, do not judge your brother. This is not about that today. What this is about is you look at yourself. You know that look in the mirror thing? You, you look at God, you look at between you and God. I, I'm not talking about, when I ask that question, which one are you most like? I'm not judging you. I'm asking you to do spiritual self-assessment between you and God. And I think that's what James is teaching. You know, the, am, I, am I really in this Christian thing to live a half-baked fake religion for some other motive? Or am I in this Christian thing, I love this, this, this old idiom, lock, stock, and barrel. It, it's, a, it's an old reference to a gun which includes all parts of the whole gun. <laughs> am I in this Christian thing 100% because it's real, because Jesus is real, because God's word is true, and because God has saved me, not from anything I've ever done for myself or for him in any way to deserve it. God has saved me, and he's brought me forth by the word of his power. I've heard his gospel preached. I believe, and now he's going to use me to glorify himself in the world, and I am his, and I'll do whatever he wants. Is that what I'm in it for? Or am I in it for some other ulterior motive? You know, there was a, there was a, a church, I won't name it, in a previous state where we, we served 20-some years ago, and... Uh, Everyone in town knew that that was the university church. And if you were a professor at the university, you had to go to that church because you had to network there with other leaders and other professionals. Whew. It's not why you go to church. It's not, it's not why we worship Jesus. It's not why we disciple one another to teach each other to be better followers of Jesus. It's not why we, we sacrifice financially and life and limb and liberty to go share the gospel in a place where Jesus has never been heard. We don't do that to network in a business. So which one describes you? If the first, the pure and undefiled religion description, then remain in his word as the source of your strength and stay humble. If the second, then realize that you may be pretending and you may be in need of true conversion whereby you accept the word of God in humility and repent and receive Jesus as master of your life. For all of us, we must trust the truth of God's word over and above our own thoughts and experiences, our own opinions, so that we may be free to live a godly life. The radical change that happened in my life was the day that I realized from the preaching of God's word that this is not human opinion. This is the word of God. So the only thing I can do is humbly receive and accept it. 
And if I don't, I will pay for that. So I want to close with how Jesus taught this, and and I certainly believe that um, James knew of this teaching from Matthew 7, and and I want you to hear uh, some of the similarity. In Matthew 7, 13, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ began, um, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me, on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I declared to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, when Jesus taught this in Matthew 7, he's even speaking to people who claimed to be his. Lord, Lord, they called him. Didn't we do this for you, they said. So the difference in Matthew 7, I believe, is is very similar to the difference in James, as James is trying to teach it to us. There are religious people who just don't know Jesus. But we need to make sure that we live in a pure and undefiled and real religion with Jesus. And he closed, Jesus in Matthew 7, I'm going to pick up here, he closed um, his teaching with an illustration which I hope many of you are familiar with. He said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell And great was its fall. When you look at verses 24 through 27 of Matthew 7 and Jesus' teachings there, you realize that that the difference between these two men, one who builds his house on the rock and one who builds his house on the sand, what's the difference? Do they both hear the word of God? In the text, they do. They both hear it. The difference is, is the one who built his house on the rock is the one who acts on what he hears. And I think that's what James is saying. Don't just be hearers, but effectual doers. Have you heard the word of God? Good, now do it. Now repent. Now believe. Now surrender. Now give your life to Christ. By grace through faith, repent and be saved. Now do it. And then follow through with everything else Jesus teaches. What are we waiting for? Be doers. And I think that's the essence of what James is teaching here. And so, uh, you know, last week I kind of laughed at myself because I said, um, I can't believe I'm quoting uh, Larry the Cable Guy. So this week I'm going to close with an illustration that sounds like Jeff Foxworthy. Does anybody know who Jeff Foxworthy is? And I'm not even sure uh, where his faith is. Um, I'm just going to play a Jeff Foxworthy game Um, You know, Jeff Foxworthy was known early on as a comedian to talk about, you might be a redneck if. You know, he had a lot of those jokes. You might be a redneck if. I'm going to borrow from Jeff Foxworthy, and I'm going to do this. 
I'm going to talk about a cultural Christian versus a biblical true Christian. You might be a cultural Christian if you think you're a Christian because your parents were. You might be a cultural Christian if you Google things to find answers to life questions rather than search the Bible. You might be a cultural Christian if you can't worship without the screens and the sound system. You might be a cultural Christian if you think that worship would be better if there was less preaching of the Bible. You might be a cultural Christian if you choose a church based upon what it can give you rather than how you can serve. You might be a cultural Christian if you gravitate towards a me mentality. You might be a cultural Christian if you consider sacrifice something that others should do for you. You might be a cultural Christian if you think that evangelism and missions is good for some, but not for you. You might be a cultural Christian if you think that others just claiming to be Christian is enough, even if their lives do not bear fruit. There's a lot of that going around in our culture, right? Well, he says he's a Christian. Yeah, but he still drinks. I mean, to the point of being sinful and drunk. Um, you might be a cultural Christian. You want all the blessings of God, but complain when things don't go your way. You might be a cultural Christian when what others think about you is more important to you than what others think about Christ. You might be a cultural Christian if you think Providence is a city on the East Coast. You might be a cultural Christian if you think that God would never override or go against a man's free will like he did to Pharaoh. You might be a cultural Christian if you think you know better how to live your life than what the Bible teaches. You might be a cultural Christian if you think that marriage is not a distinctly Christian institution between one Christian man and one Christian woman as God intended. You might be a cultural Christian if you think it's okay to kill the unborn. You might be a cultural Christian if you think God is like you and you can make him be whatever you want. You might be a cultural Christian if you spend more time on Facebook than on your face in prayer. But you might be a biblical Christian if you had a born-again experience wherein you personally believed that Jesus died for your sin and rose again from the dead and you cried out to him in personal prayer to save you. You might be a biblical Christian if you have an inner and ongoing conviction of sin and you quickly repent. You despise the world and its ways. You might be a biblical Christian, a true Christian, if you have an inner and ongoing desire to obey his teachings in the Bible. You might be a true and biblical Christian if you have a hunger for and a growing understanding of the Bible. You might be a true Christian if you naturally desire for those who do not know Jesus to know him so you're willing to go and share and tell them. You might be a true Christian if you are willing to sacrifice, to die to yourself in order to live for Christ. If you're quick to do what you hear in his word, you might be a true Christian if his will is more important than your will. So what I want to do is close in a word of prayer. We'll sing a commitment hymn and then I'm going to come back with a, an update of FBC Ministries. And, uh, you know, I, whether I played that Jeff Foxworthy game or not, I hope it makes a point. And I, and I hope that the point is the same thing James was saying, which is this. You know, let's not be in this religious thing to live any other kind of religion than the pure, undefiled, real one. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit bring revival to your church, to your people, uh, to your nations uh, around the world that, that you said that people from every tribe and tongue and nation will come and worship you, uh, be represented at your throne in Revelation 5 and Revelation 7. So, Lord, I pray for your glory to be manifest so that you and you alone are given the credit that no human being can take the credit. I pray, Lord, that you even use the season 
of this coronavirus and, and all the fear that's going on around in the world to bring people's hearts and minds to focus on you, to bring about true and undefiled religion of repentant people receiving your word with humility and turning to Jesus Christ first and then being willing to live out your word in an uncertain world. Above all, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died on the cross for us and you rose again from the dead. May you bless your people today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.